I'm Dr. Dominic Fontana, and I'm here to talk about the Langston Harbour archaeological projects that were carried out in 1993, 94, and 1995 in Langston Harbour on the south coast of England. Langston Harbour is one of a set of three harbours uh, alongside Portsmouth in the central south coast of England just to the north of the Solent with the Isle of Wight to the south. Um, it's basically a large harbour that's about five kilometres from north to south and about four kilometres from east to west. So Langston Harbour is a huge extent of water when the tide's in and a very large extent of mudflats when the tide's out. In the north of the harbour, there are uh, a series of small islands, some of which have been joined together in the 18th century to create some rough grazing land, and some which still remain as separate islands. Um, they're barely above sea level when the tide is in. In fact, on spring tides, some of them can flood right across the top. So they're re really very marginal land. Um, and have remained so throughout their existence. And those islands are the site of some of the really exciting, really interesting archaeological finds that we've made in Langston Harbour during the survey work that we did in the 1990s. It was one of the early approaches to uh, intertidal archaeology, um, partly instigated by Hampshire County Council, partly instigated by the formation of the Hampshire and White Trust for Maritime Archaeology under Brian Sparks at the time, um, and also incorporating my team from the Department of Geography at the University of Portsmouth, who were interested in GIS and surveying and mapping uh, archaeological data. So we were bringing these together uh, along with support from Wessex Archaeology, who were providing the archaeological interpretation and the archaeological field team. The first season was in 1993, and it involved some rapid walkover surveys around various parts of the harbour, just simply to look and see what we could find. We knew from previous work by um, uh, Barry Cunliffe and uh, Richard Bradley and Barry Hooper that there probably was going to be archaeological material to find, um, but we really had no notion of what we might find. And I must admit, I'll never forget going out on our first walkover to the south of North Binnis Island when we literally tripped over a Bronze Age pot still sitting on the hearth on which that pot had been heated some three and a half thousand years earlier. So we started by doing rapid walkover surveys, looking at various parts of the harbour, and it's a very big extent, so it takes a lot of walking around by an archaeological field team of three simply looking at the ground and seeing what they could find. Um, this did give us some data from the first year. Uh, we were able to find Bronze Age pottery, we found um, um, Mesolithic microliths and similar material. So, working through our processes and our protocols of uh, how we implemented this from the first season, we decided we'd try and improve what we were doing for the second season in 1994. And so we instigated a process of mapping gridded areas, um, generally about 50 metres by 50 metres, divided up into two metre grid squares. Um, and then we'd work out the positions of the fines in relation to those grid square units. And that produced a very useful set of data which could be mapped um, against the contextual data of those locations. Again, the problem was simply going around all of the harbour and the immense complexity of the, the material that we were finding because it came from all periods. 
um, Mesolithic microliths, um, then Neolithic material from uh, tree stumps to burnt flints and hearths, uh, Bronze Age material, um, pottery, pottery fragments, right through to some Roman pottery, uh, areas of uh, hurdling, so wicker hurdling, um, which were most probably Saxon in origin, um, some Saxon dated uh, wooden objects, uh, including a, uh, a log boat, which was found late in the process. Um, so a place that included a lot of that sort of material, but also included later uh, material in, in other parts of the harbour. Along the shore of uh, Hailing Island, um, there were a whole series of timber alignments, some of which we knew probably were from uh, an ill-fated attempt to build uh, a scientific oyster fishery by a chap called Harry Lobb in the 1860s, where he was trying to develop an oyster cultivation system that uh, could provide cheap and plentiful protein for the masses. Um, it's not a it's not a, an enterprise that was all that successful ultimately, um, and then down to the south of those a number of other alignments, which had always intrigued me ever since I was a, a little kid, wandering around parts of Langston Harbour because they were stakes going down into the the mud which had been eaten back by marine mollusks near enough to the surface, but they were there as lines of stakes driven down into the mud. And when looking at them, um, they certainly seemed very, very similar to eel traps or fish traps that are elsewhere around the coast of England. So we plotted all of these down the uh, western coast of Hailing Island and um, we looked at how they were and where they were situated. And in most cases, they were associated with freshwater outfalls from the springs that come up underneath the land of Hailing Island. So there was fresh water coming into the um, distinctly seawater, the brackish water of uh, Langston Harbour when the tide was up. And it seemed to me that that was likely to indicate that these were eel traps um, intended to catch uh, eels and fish um, coming in with the rising tide and making their way up towards these freshwater areas and probably nutrient rich areas and possibly with plenty of insects and so on that the fish would feed on. Um, we didn't know what period they came from. Indeed, we still don't know that because no um, objective dating has been done on these structures. But it will be interesting to find out in due course um, when some carbon dates are, uh, are available or some dendrochronology dates. So we plotted those and uh, we also looked at the area um, around um, the Locksway area of Portsmouth, which includes uh, a sort of sub area of Portsmouth, of Langston, a sub area of Langston Harbour, which is uh, Eastney Lake. And that is uh, an area in which a good deal of civil engineering was done for um, the building of the Portsmouth and Arundel Canal in 1822. Well, it opened in 1822. Again, not a very successful enterprise because it closed in um, 1827. So it operated for just five years. But there's quite a number of timber alignments uh, in that part of the harbour, which were still pretty substantial in the 1990s, and indeed are still pretty substantial today in the 2020s. There was also the structure of the lock that allowed barges to go into, um, into Portsmouth and make their way into the centre of Portsmouth. Uh, so there's substantial brick remains that go with that. 
So around the rest of the harbour and doing the field work over the three seasons meant that we were able to look at large parts of the harbour. But clearly there were some locations that had more interesting, more archaeological potential than others. And in particular, that was the area around the four islands at the north of Langston Harbour, uh, North Binnis Island in particular, um, which had some very interesting Bronze Age deposits, Long Island that adjoins it, uh, which had, again, Bronze Age and uh, some Mesolithic deposits, and the islands to the south of Baker's Island. Interesting because it had uh, some very nice worked flint that came from that location, and also because it had the remains of a Second World War decoy lighting system called Starfish. It was uh, uh, a system set up by um, the government, the British government, to uh, provide decoy lighting for Luftwaffe bombing raids during the Second World War to entice the Luftwaffe bombers to drop their bombs into Langston Harbour rather than over the city of Portsmouth and its dockyards. So these were systems set up to produce uh, um, a, an illusion of buildings burning at night time, of explosions going off, but doing so harmlessly out in the mudflats. It's this huge range of history that's there in the in the harbour, uh, from Mesolithic through to the Second World War. Um, but in a landscape that was largely unchanged um, throughout much of that time, other than by the natural processes of the changing relationship between land and sea. The key to the whole project really was the way we were thinking about the data and how we collected it. In the early 1990s, GIS was a very new thing. Geographic information systems and the notion of being able to plot individual object locations into a digital map. It was very new and it was something that my team had been working on mapping school sites for grounds maintenance in schools around Hampshire. But we realized that we could take this technology and redeploy it into an archaeological context where we could take archaeological find spots and reconstruct them in a digital map, which would give us a lot more possibilities of understanding and examining the data. At the time, the early 1990s, the technology was quite limited, but the technology was rapidly improving. So we acquired a copy of MapInfo version 4, which was our first one. It was very expensive at the time, but it gave us the possibility of mapping data gathered out in the field very rapidly and producing different visualizations. This differs from traditional means of archaeological data transmission in that uh, at the time the standard method was by um, use of a monograph or published paper. Largely, that wouldn't include the actual data that was gathered out in the field, but would include text interpretations, might include a, a sketch diagram, it might include uh, a small map that would show you roughly where it came from. But I was actually much more interested in gathering the data with spatial precision, both in terms of its planned position and its height, so that we could understand something about the relationship between land and sea and the archaeological find and the sea level, but also so that we were able to um, reconstruct that data later on. So the data that we gathered in the seasons of 1993, 94 and 1995 are still available as GIS data sets and can be used by modern GIS software such as QGIS or ArcMap or, or whatever. But it means that that data is still viable, it's still usable, it's still explorable in the same way that it was back in the 1990s.
And certainly when we were working on the project, I was very aware of the need to make sure that most of the data we collected was still going to be usable, even into systems that I didn't then know anything about. So one of the things that I did was to ensure that point data was supplied in the archive as CSV files and text files that could probably be read by very simple programs, could certainly be read by Microsoft Excel or any other spreadsheet, which in turn meant that they'd probably be usable into a GIS, provided that they had explicit X and Y and Z coordinates. And I think on the whole, that's worked pretty well because um, nearly 30 years later, that data is still usable. And um, I find that extremely exciting if we can go and gather more data from the same locations today, because it means that we can really tie up the information between that which was collected in the mid, early mid-1990s with that which might be collected in the next year or two. So I hope that's given you a, an overview of some of the work that we did in Langston Harbour in the 1990s and how that information has been handled and is being passed on to future archaeologists. And I really hope that the Citizen Project's going to be able to make use of that archaeological data in informing the studies that it's going to undertake uh, in Langston Harbour, and that that will add further value to that information that's gathered over the years to come. Langston Harbour is such a, a special place, both for its archaeology, but also for its, its landscape. It's a lovely place to be. It's wide open skies, wide open water, and lots and lots of mud.